Today's episode is brought to you by Audible. Now, I have been exclusively listening to audiobooks for years now because it makes it so easy for me to get immersed in a story when I hear a voice other than my own telling it, and I'm listening to them all on Audible. I wanted to specifically mention a thriller today that I want to recommend to you called The Secrets She Keeps by Michael Robotham. There were so many twists and turns, guys, that I could not put it down. I had to find out what happened next. So definitely check that one out if you're looking for your next thriller. And if you aren't an Audible subscriber yet, boy oh boy are you missing out. Members get full access to a growing selection of included audiobooks, Audible originals, and podcasts. And if thriller isn't your thing 100% of the time, that's totally okay. Audible offers an incredible selection of audiobooks, podcasts, Audible originals, I mean so much, and it's all across every genre. Bestsellers, new releases, celebrity memoirs, mysteries, thrillers, motivation, wellness, business, I mean, so much more. And what I love, love, love most about Audible is I can listen to it anywhere. It is so convenient because I have the app on my phone. So I can listen to my audiobook between podcast recordings, between case research, I mean, whenever and wherever I want. So if you haven't tried it yet, guys, that's okay. New members can get a free trial of Audible. Just go to audible.com slash Annie Elise or text Annie Elise to 500, 500 for your free trial. Hey everybody, welcome back to an all new episode of 10 to Life with me, Annie Elise. Thank you for joining me today. I am, I don't know, I don't know, I'm kind of indifferent about today's case because it's one that just doesn't, it doesn't hit, it doesn't sit right, it's one that's really bugging me. So I am kind of actually looking forward to talking about it with you guys. For me, I always find it pretty cathartic to jump on the mic, talk about these cases with you guys, so... I don't know. Weirdest intro ever, right? Hi, hi, hi. (laughs) Let me start that over, guys. Sorry. Um, Okay, I guess here's why it's sticking out to me so much. Because I feel like criminal investigations, they tend to follow a very predictable pattern, right? Somebody reports a crime, then the police look into evidence, they question the witnesses, then they compile all of, you know, their information before they identify their main suspects. But today's case, it played out pretty differently. A woman was kidnapped, and the police didn't have to do much at all to figure out who the kidnapper was. In fact, the victim called 911 herself while her abduction was in progress. And a bunch of other witnesses also called 911, and they all said exactly who took her, what kind of vehicle they were in, where they were, everything. So from there, the dispatchers could follow each beat of the crime as it happened, just in real time, pretty seamlessly, right? But somehow, this information never made it to actual police officers, which led to a very tragic outcome. It's truly a bizarre case, and even now as I'm telling it, I have to wonder, what went wrong? How did it happen? How did nobody do what they had to do to save this woman? It's a long story. It's a wild story. So let's get right into it. From the time that Denise Amber Goff was born on August 6th, 1986, she was always known for being quiet, but very happy. She was shy, she loved to read, did well in school, and she was especially good at math. Now, during her senior year of high school, she met a boy named Nathan Lee. Nathan was two years older than Denise, meaning he had already graduated high school. But in fairness, their age gap, it wasn't enormous. It wasn't anything crazy, just he was out of school. Now, importantly, Nathan was basically everything that Denise wasn't. And you know what they say, opposites attract, right? It's pretty common. And Denise thought that Nathan was really cute, so much so that this very quiet and withdrawn type of girl actually worked up the courage to ask him out. So they went on a date together to a local Applebee's. She talked to him the entire time. I mean, she didn't even pause long enough to eat. They just were hitting it off, and she was just go, go, go nonstop. And as it turned out, Denise would do this. She would come out of her shell if she really clicked with somebody. And she and Nathan, they really clicked. They made things official, and three weeks later, on Valentine's Day, Nathan gave her a small heart-shaped ring. 
Now, it wasn't anything super fancy. It only cost him about $40, but it really meant a lot to Denise. So she put it on that day, and she never took it off. And then, just a short while later, the two of them got engaged. In 2004, Denise graduated high school with the highest honors, and her wedding was a year later on August 20th, 2005. Now, Denise and Nathan were still really young. At this point, Denise was only 19 years old, and Nathan was 21 years old. But they were committed to making things work. And according to their friends, Denise and Nathan were both fairly mature, and they were level-headed for their ages, so this is something they wanted to do. Soon after the wedding, Denise became pregnant, and in the course of about two years, she and Nathan had two sons, Noah and Adam. Since they were such a young couple with two small children, as I'm sure you can imagine, money was pretty tight. So Denise put her college plans on hold so that she could be a stay-at-home mom. She also didn't seem to mind because motherhood was her top priority. Meanwhile, Nathan was the sole breadwinner, and he worked three different jobs to make ends meet. He picked up shifts at the local Winn-Dixie grocery store, he was a meter reader for a power company, and in the summer, he was an umpire for a Little League baseball team. But that setup didn't last forever, and the family eventually moved to Northport, Florida, where they rented a brand new house. Now, the good news was rent was really affordable in this neighborhood, and Denise had grown up in this area as well, so she knew it well. The problem was, Denise's parents, Rick and Sue, were not happy with this move. I mean, they were not thrilled, to say the least. The new home was in a super rural area. There was some construction nearby, but otherwise, there were no real neighbors, nothing. So Rick and Sue thought that it wasn't safe. Now, on the other hand, Denise and Nathan also always had talked about wanting to get away from everything else. So the fact that this house was so remote was actually part of the appeal to them. Plus, I mean, the cheap rent was too good of a deal for this young couple to pass up. It was like too good to be true. Her parents, Rick and Sue, didn't live all that far away. So if anything ever went horribly wrong, they could get to the house pretty quickly, at least in theory. So now let's jump ahead to the early morning of January 17th, 2008. Nathan was getting ready to go to his meter reader job. He was the only person who was awake in the house, which wasn't that unusual. He almost always left for work before Denise or the kids woke up. So it was rainy and it was quiet when Nathan headed out for the day. It was also pretty typical for Nathan and Denise to talk on the phone all day long. And the day started pretty normally in that regard. He called Denise around 11 a.m., and she said that she was on the back porch giving their son Noah a haircut. They talked for a little while longer, and Nathan asked Denise to open up the windows. See, it was a pretty cool day, and this was going to help them avoid turning on the AC and running up the energy bill. But Denise was already one step ahead of him. She said she already opened the windows, they were already up, they had been open since she woke up that day, she was already 10 steps ahead. At the time, the conversation honestly felt pretty unremarkable, the sort of thing that they'd both go on to forget about completely. That is, if it wasn't for what happened later on that day. Denise and Nathan told each other goodbye, and Nathan promised that he would call back again later in the day. Then, at 3 o'clock that afternoon, Nathan was leaving work when he decided to call Denise again, as he had promised. It had now been four hours since the last time that they spoke. But this time around she didn't answer. Which, okay, fine, maybe she was busy, or maybe she was in the bathroom, or something like that. Sometimes people aren't by their phones ready to pick up at any moment. So Nathan waited for a few minutes, and then he tried again. But once more, Denise didn't answer. Now this was weirder, and Nathan started getting more aggressive about calling. He dialed Denise's number eight times during his drive home, which, for the record, was only a 25-minute drive but she didn't pick up at any point. So he turned onto their street, and the house came into view, and this only made him even more nervous. He noticed right away that all of the windows were closed, which stuck out to him after that earlier conversation, because remember, Denise said that she had opened up all of the windows. Her car was also in the driveway. The front doors were locked, and when Nathan went inside the house, he found her car keys, her purse, and her cell phone. There were no signs of a struggle or forced entry, and nothing was broken. I mean, all was pretty normal, except he couldn't find Denise. 
Plus, the house, it was pretty warm from the windows being closed and the air conditioner being left off. They also weren't locked. So Nathan thought that it looked like someone had pushed them down before leaving in a rush. Some of Denise's clothing was laid out and Nathan thought that it looked like maybe she was going to change, maybe after taking a shower. You know how you'll lay something out on your bed or on a chair and then when you get out of the shower, you'll throw it on. But it looked as though somebody must have interrupted her from this. The good news was their children, Noah and Adam, were in their room, but they were both in the same crib and they also both had soiled diapers. Other than that, they were fine, but Denise would not have left them like this. It was wildly out of character. Like I said before, she was a great mom. She would never have left a two-year-old and a six-month-old home alone. Never. So this was all just confirmation for Nathan that something was seriously wrong here. He called Denise's mom, but she said that she hadn't heard anything either. And this was the last straw for Nathan, so he called 911. Northport Emergency. Uh, yes, um, I'm at 7912 uh, Latour Avenue. Uh, mm -hmm. I just got home from work and my wife, I can't find her. My kids were in the house and I don't know where she is. I've looked every single place. He told the operator that he couldn't find Denise, even after he scoured the entire house. And basically he said everything that I have covered so far. So when he was done talking to the operator, Nathan called Denise's father, Rick. Now, Rick was a police sergeant with 25 years of experience with the Charlotte County Police Department. So Nathan knew that Rick would know exactly what to do in this situation. Coincidentally, Rick had also been trying to get in touch with Denise that day. He had called her earlier to see if she wanted to come over for dinner. And when she didn't answer, he left a voicemail. So now when Rick saw Nathan's name on the caller ID, he figured that he was calling to talk about their dinner plans. So he answered by saying, hey, do you want to come over and eat? But Nathan said, no, Denise is missing. Rick didn't quite understand what Nathan meant and he asked him to explain. So Nathan then went through the entire story. From there, Rick knew how to get in contact with the right people. He called everybody he knew and he told them what had happened. But he also gave his colleagues some very strange instructions. He said that nobody should look into Nathan. Now, supposedly, he had a good reason for this. He knew that when a woman goes missing, most of the time, the boyfriend, the husband, the ex, they're responsible. But Rick was also 100% sure that Nathan would never hurt Denise. His whole family also agreed with his assessment in this. So in his mind, it just made sense to tell the other police officers, hey, don't even waste your time looking at Nathan. Somebody else had to be responsible for this. Don't even waste time, resources, energy, focus elsewhere. Now, I have to be honest, I don't love the way that Rick was directing the investigation away from Nathan, but it also was really crucial for him to make sure that nobody was wasting those precious early hours and resources after her disappearance. We know that the first 48 hours are crucial because that's when witnesses' memories are the freshest and the physical evidence hasn't been washed away or hidden yet. And of course, if Denise was hurt or if she needed immediate help, it would do her no good for the police to waste their time questioning her husband. So Rick told police officers that Denise had probably been kidnapped and he instructed that they needed to get helicopters, search dogs, all of these things to the area immediately. He even called a journalist that he knew so that the media could spread the word of Denise's disappearance. So pretty soon, officers from the Northport Police Department arrived to the family's home. Like Nathan, they didn't find anything suspicious about the house. It was eerie, though, how there was no sign that anybody had broken in or done anything violent, and it was really hard to tell anything, really. The two boys were at home when Denise went missing, but they were too young to give the police any information. I mean, we're talking about a two-year-old and a six-month-old here, right? So with no obvious leads, the detective's next move was to ignore Rick's advice, and it was to question Nathan question him about their marriage, about things like how often they got into arguments, whether or not he thought that they were in a good place. Pretty standard, right? So the conversation was going on when Denise's parents arrived, and they were instantly frustrated by this conversation. I mean, Rick in particular. He was thinking, hey, didn't I tell you explicitly not to do this? Why are we wasting our time with Nathan when we could be out looking for Denise? 
So, at his insisting and prodding, the police then searched the neighborhood and started talking to the neighbors. They knocked on one door, and a teenager named Jennifer answered. Her house was just one house over from Denise and Nathan's, and it had a big window that was facing the street. Jennifer said that during the afternoon, she was watching TV when she noticed a very strange car going up and down the road. Now, when I say it was strange, I don't mean it was unfamiliar. Jennifer wouldn't even have any way of knowing if a car belonged on the street or not. She didn't live there. She was actually just visiting relatives at the time, and that's why she was in the house. But she said that the car was, and this is a direct quote, creeping up and down my road, going very slow. So she watched it kind of scoot up and down the street four or five times. Then she decided to walk out and talk to this driver. She figured, okay, maybe they're lost. Maybe they need directions. And that's when Jennifer made eye contact with the driver. He was a heavy set white man with light colored hair. She also didn't see anybody else in the car. But right as she spotted him, the car pulled into the family's driveway. So Jennifer figured, oh, he must not be lost. He must have found his destination. So she just decided to go back inside. And she pretty much forgot the entire interaction right away. Then about 10 to 15 minutes later, around 2.30 that afternoon, Jennifer saw the car pulling out of the family's driveway and driving away. Again, she didn't see anybody else with this man. And also she said she never saw anybody get into or out of the car. However, we know that that doesn't mean much because she wasn't watching all that closely. She was watching TV. So the officers got a description of the car, and Jennifer says that it was a 90s Camaro, that it was green, it had a black car, like, bra type thing on the front, and that's the word for those, like, black bands across the front bumper, and it protects it from things like bugs, debris, all that kind of stuff. So with that description, the police sent out a bolo, a be on the lookout. It's another term for an all-points bulletin, and it's basically a way for the police to be like, hey, there's a crime in progress, it's dangerous, if you see anything fitting this description, you better call it in right away, stay away, it's dangerous, whatever that might be. So in this case, the bolo was for the green car, but departments can also issue them for people of interest or anything else that's super high priority. So it went out to all of the nearby police departments and also to the highway patrol, but it didn't go out to every department, which I will get into later. So at 6.14 p.m., which was about an hour and a half after Denise was reported as missing, the Sarasota 911 call center received a call from a very, very upset woman. She was saying, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I just want to see my family again. Please let me go, just let me go. Which was very unnerving. But even worse, the operator could hear a man in the background. So it sounded like this woman was pleading with him. The 911 dispatcher tried to ask this woman questions, but she wasn't answering. Eventually, the operator realized that the woman might not have been in a position where it was safe to talk. She may have even had the phone sitting on her lap or on the floor somewhere where she couldn't hear the dispatcher or just trying to make that call so that she could hear that she was in trouble so they could keep track of everything that was being said and try to guess what was going on. That is until this woman on the phone said, My name is Denise. I'm married to a beautiful husband and I just want to see my kids again. It was like they had worked out a secret code somehow. The dispatcher could ask a question, and Denise would find a way to answer it without giving away the fact that she was on the phone. She would direct the statements to the man, presumably her kidnapper, and then the operator could still learn everything that she needed to know. So the dispatcher kept asking Denise about what was going on. And Denise did her best, did everything that she could with these answers, trying to give as much away as she possibly could. She asked her kidnapper where they were and where they were going, but he wouldn't tell her. However, during all of this, the dispatcher could hear the radio in the background, which unfortunately made it very hard to make out what this man was saying. And then at one point, the call took a turn. It seemed like the man had noticed that his phone was missing, and he was now asking Denise where it was. This meant that Denise was now in a lot more danger. Who knew what this guy would do if he learned that she had not only gotten her hands on his phone, but also had called 911. In fact, it seemed like at this point, Denise figured out that the jig was up because she started openly talking to the dispatcher now, telling them everything they needed to know. So when the man asked again where the phone was, Denise started repeating, I don't know, I don't know. She asked the man to let her out, let her out of this car. And the last thing that the 911 dispatcher heard was, help me. Then the call ended. 
Now, there have been some allegations that this call might have been fake. By this point, Denise's disappearance was all over the news, so it wouldn't be hard for somebody to pretend to be her and to call 911 all for the attention, because unfortunately, stuff like that does happen. But Denise's father, Rick, listened to this call, and he confirmed that it was his daughter's voice. So with that, police officers tried tracing the call, but it had been made using a prepaid phone that didn't have any sort of GPS installed. The good news is, they did figure out who the phone was registered to, somebody named Michael King. A name that unfortunately meant nothing to Denise's family, and it didn't help explain why Denise was taken. However, around the same time that Denise called 911, the Sarasota Call Center received another suspicious call. It was from a woman named Sabrina, who said that her father, Harold Muxlow, had just called her because he saw something really weird. Around 5.30, so we're talking maybe 45 minutes earlier, an unexpected visitor had dropped by Harold's house. It was his cousin, Michael King. Michael said that his lawnmower had gotten stuck in his yard, and in order to get it out, he was hoping to borrow Harold's gas can, his shovel, and his flashlight. Harold said that he was happy to help, and they gathered up the items, and then Michael went to put them in his car. Then, when Harold turned around to go back inside, he said he heard a woman screamed, call the cops. Now at that moment, Harold wasn't looking at Michael. He was about to walk inside the house, but he asked what that sound was. And when he turned around, he saw that Michael seemed to be struggling with something in his back seat, like he was pushing something or somebody down. Finally, Michael got whatever it was under control and he told Harold that it was nothing and not to worry about it. So Harold started walking back to his house again, but the whole situation didn't feel right. Obviously, I mean, I can't even think of any innocent explanation for what Harold saw. So he turned around again, and this time he saw that Michael was bent over the center console in his car, and he was pushing down a woman's head. She had light brown, shoulder-length hair, but Harold didn't recognize her. When Michael sat back down in the driver's seat, her legs shot up in the air, and then he sped off in a huge rush. Now, Harold wasn't sure what to think about this. He knew that Michael had a pretty rocky dating history, so he didn't want to jump to conclusions and just call the police. So he apparently just decided to mind his own business, which sadly is a really common mentality, but that doesn't make it okay. I mean, if that woman wasn't Denise, but say was one of Michael's girlfriends instead, would it make it any better? I mean, there's still absolutely no excuse to abduct somebody against their will or shove them in your car if they don't want to go with you. I mean, none. Harold wasn't watching a couple arguing about the dishes or something like little like that. I mean, this was clearly a violent encounter and a woman was in danger. So I will say this right now. I don't care what anybody's relationship history is. If you think you are witnessing a kidnapping or a domestic dispute, call the police. But I will say this, to Harold's credit, he decided not to let things end there. He decided to drive to Michael's house and see if his lawnmower was actually stuck in his yard. He figured if he saw the mower there, that meant that Harold was telling the truth and he could forget about the whole encounter. But if it wasn't in the yard, that meant that Michael was lying and that something serious was going down. So Harold drove over to Michael's house and what do you know, there was no lawnmower in his yard. And yet Harold still didn't call 911 because he said he didn't want to jump to conclusions. Now, personally, I don't want to keep harping on this, but I really don't know what he means by jumping to conclusions when it was pretty obvious what was going on here and that something was afoot. But either way, instead of dialing 911, Harold called his daughter Sabrina. And then after Harold told Sabrina everything that had happened, Sabrina said he absolutely needed to call 911. He needed to call and report this right away. There was something clearly wrong here. Harold actually even tried to argue with her about this though. And I mean, I gotta say, like, what is this guy's deal? Like, everybody is telling you the writing is on the wall. So Sabrina hung up on him and she called the dispatcher herself. And the girl came out of the, like, got out of the car and my, co my dad's cousin went and put her back in the car and when she got out. Okay, where's your, where's your dad's house? Um, it's in North Florida. Where would he be going with this female? He came over to my dad's house, borrowed a shovel, a gas tank, and something else. Okay, we've been looking for this female. You are just so wonderful to call us and give us this, this information. 
Okay. Yeah. Not only did she say everything that Harold had told her, but she also explained who Michael was and where he lived. The 911 operator told Sabrina, you are so wonderful to call and give us this information. Like, thank you. And then the two of them hung up. So at this point, two people had called 911 about Denise's disappearance, one being Denise herself and one being Sabrina. The police had the kidnapper's name, where he lived, and a description of his car. But the calls didn't stop there. Because at 6.30 p.m., a woman named Jane Kowalski also connected with 911, and she stayed on the line for about nine minutes. However, and this is important, Jane's call was routed to the Charlotte County Emergency Dispatch, not Sarasota County, like the previous calls. Northport is really close to the Sarasota slash Charlotte County lines, and Jane at the time was driving on Highway 41. She had just crossed the border, which is why her call now went to this other dispatch center. So at the start of the call, Jane said that she was at a stoplight, and she could hear screaming coming from the car next to her. She said it sounded like a terrified child, and that it was so bad that Jane knew that this wasn't an ordinary tantrum or anything like that. She thought that a little kid was being kidnapped in this moment, or something else really horrible was happening in that car. And she described this car as a blue Camaro. Jane also said that while she was stopped next to the car, she looked over, made eye contact with the driver, and she saw a small hand reach up and bang on the passenger side window. She said that when the light turned green, she didn't move in hopes that the car would drive in front of her and she could get the license plate. But apparently, the Camaro driver knew what she was doing, and he didn't move either. So eventually, people started honking, so Jane pulled forward a bit, and then the Camaro switched lanes, moving behind her. Now in Florida, cars aren't required to have front license plates, so there was nothing that Jane could see. 911, where's your emergency? Well, I'm on 41 going south, and uh, I'm going to do a cross street right now. It's at, I'm on Chamberlain, I just crossed Chamberlain, I'm on 41 going south. And I was at a stoplight, and a man pulled up next to me, and there was a child screaming in the car. What kind of vehicle was he in? It's a blue Camaro, uh, like Camaro, like uh, in the 90s or early 2000s or something. He's going to turn left on Toledo Blade. He's turning left right now. Do you want me to turn? Try to follow him or? Okay. Does he want her to follow him? Okay. Can you turn? Oh, just... oh. He just turned on Toledo Blade. I don't know if I can catch up. There's a bunch of traffic and I can't get over. She stayed on the phone with 911 and kept driving, hoping that she could switch lanes and get that license plate, but the Camaro took a sharp left on Toledo Blade Boulevard, headed toward the I-75 on-ramp. So that's when she hung up after following the Camaro, and she narrated the entire trip for the 911 dispatcher for nine minutes. So clearly, Jane didn't get all of the facts right. The kidnapping victim wasn't a child, it was Denise, the car wasn't blue, it was the same green car that Jennifer had seen earlier. But luckily, even with all of those little mistakes, the 911 operator figured out what was going on right away. She even stood up during the call really excited and shouted, it's about the vehicle that they're looking for. But for reasons that absolutely defy explanation, the 911 operator didn't write the information in her call log until later. So the patrol officers in the area didn't get any timely updates about the car's location or its description while Jane was on the phone with them. They also never received the Bolo description. Apparently, there was one specific person who was in charge of receiving and distributing those notices for the county. And they were home for the day. So this was an absolutely wild series of missteps, guys. I mean, the police literally should have had all of the information that they needed right at their fingerprints, but a few key people failed to share it. So instead, the Charlotte County police officers don't know what car they're looking for or where they should even be looking for it. Now, what makes this even worse is that Michael King passed multiple police officers while Jane was on the phone with 911. So if the operator had immediately filled out that call log, they could have pulled Michael over. Instead, four minutes passed between the time that Jane hung up the phone and when the updated information went out. Since she was on the line with the operator for nine minutes, that means that there were 12 whole minutes that went by between the time that Jane first called 
to when any police officers were able to do anything with that information. Right afterward, the 911 operator's shift ended, and in the shuffle of people heading home and other people coming in, Jane's phone call basically got forgotten about. In Sarasota County, the Northport Police Department didn't hear anything about the report until the next day. And in the meanwhile, yet another phone call about Denise's kidnapping went through to Sarasota County at 6.50 p.m. This caller said he wanted to be anonymous, but we now know that it was Harold Muxlow. I guess that he finally felt bad about not reporting the kidnapping earlier, and maybe he realized that his daughter had already shared information with the authorities, so there was no point in keeping the details to himself anymore. I don't know. Even so, Harold was very vague during the call and refused to use the word kidnapping or anything similar. The most that he would say, and this was very hesitantly, was that he wasn't, quote, sure what is happening, but it seems like somebody was taken. So pretty soon after he gave that tiny dribble of information, he said it happened in the Northport area. And then he hung up the phone. So to recap, since Nathan came home in the afternoon, a total of five 911 calls were made about Denise's disappearance. The investigators had the kidnapper's name, his address, the make and model of his car, and at certain times, his exact location, all while Denise was still in the car. As if that wasn't enough, there was a massive search underway. Volunteers were scouring the Northport area, helicopters were filling the sky, and search and rescue dogs were trying to track her down. But somehow, in spite of all of that, nobody could find her. Some police officers did go to Michael's home, but they had to wait on a search warrant. When they finally got it, his car wasn't around, but the investigators thought that they could hear voices coming from inside the house. They went inside and found that there was a TV on, but nobody was home. Those voices were just from the television. And weirdly, besides the TV, the house was almost completely empty. There was hardly any furniture. The dining room had multiple mirrors on the wall, but also some empty hooks. Like at one point, there was one more mirror and somebody had taken it down. And that missing mirror was then propped up against a wall in the master bedroom, facing a Winnie the Pooh blanket, pillows, and a yellow blanket that was covering a window. There were also pieces of duct tape in that same bedroom, and they all had long, light brown hairs stuck to them, the same color as Denise's hair. Plus, the detectives found both blood and semen on that Winnie the Pooh blanket and they didn't come from the same person. In fact, later on, the police ran the DNA, and it said that the hair and the blood were Denise's. The semen on the Winnie the Pooh blanket came from Michael. So the whole scene made the police very uncomfortable. Some of them even commented that it looked like somebody had set up this room so that they could commit a sexual assault inside of it. But since Denise wasn't in the house, that meant that the police were still looking for her, looking everywhere that they could think of. They were checking security cameras at gas stations and monitoring the entrance and exit ramps to the highway. Some officers even conducted random traffic stops to inspect people's vehicles. Two officers were stationed on Toledo Blade Boulevard, which was the last street where Jane saw Michael before he got onto I-70. So they figured that maybe whenever he got off the freeway, they might come this way again. So at 9.10 p.m., which was about five hours after Denise had been reported missing, a green Camaro exited I-75, pulling onto Toledo Blade Boulevard. The officers pulled it over, and one of them drew his gun out before yelling at Michael to get out of the car. But Michael refused. They were like that for a while, at a standstill. And then finally, the officer threatened to shoot Michael. And that is when he pushed the door open and surrendered. Now, it's worth mentioning that he was soaking wet from the waist down, for whatever reason and his shoes were also caked with mud. The officers handcuffed Michael, and they checked his car. But Denise wasn't there. The good news is, they did find a phone with the battery and SIM card removed, plus a dirt-caked shovel, a packet of baby wipes, a wooden bed railing, and a five-gallon gas can. That was all along the passenger side, along with the battery that Michael had pulled out of his phone. In the back seat, they saw a handprint on the window, a yellow blanket, a heart-shaped ring, and strands of long brown hair. And these were full strands of hair, meaning that they didn't just come out naturally. Somebody had to have yanked out this hair from the root. 
The top theory was that Denise did this to herself so that the police could find all of these belongings, her precious heart ring, and they would be able to identify her as if she was leaving clues so that people would know that she was in the car. There were also even more pieces of hair and blood spatter on the car's spoiler. Plus, there was another unidentified sticky substance. So the officers took Michael in for questioning, and all he would say was that he wanted a lawyer. At one point, they even brought in his cousin Harold to see if Michael would talk to him. Michael did end up chatting with Harold, but he told his cousin this absolutely wild and wildly improbable story. According to Michael, somebody had hijacked his car and then blindfolded him. So he had no way of knowing what was going on when the hijackers also grabbed Denise and then dumped her at a location that he couldn't identify, again, because of the blindfold. Michael even took the police to the scene of this alleged hijacking. But of course, they couldn't find a single shred of evidence to corroborate Michael's story. Obviously, nobody believed a word of what Michael was saying. So he stayed in jail while the search for Denise just continued. By this point, police knew that the odds of finding her alive were very, very low. But Denise's loved ones wanted to keep Hope alive, and they turned out in droves. I mean, they were looking for her on foot, by car, on horseback. Some people even hopped into kayaks and into boats, and they were checking out the local swamps. Eventually, authorities surveyed an abandoned construction site in Northport. The area was very rural. Sorry, I hate that word, guys. I never can say it right. But a worker had noticed a patch of dirt that looked like it had been disturbed recently. So the investigators started digging there. And eventually, just three feet and one inch below the surface, they uncovered Denise's body. She was on her side, in the fetal position. She was completely nude and there was a single gunshot wound to her head. Her gravesite had marks in the dirt near it, and they had come from a shovel, and they were a perfect fit for that shovel that was in Michael's back seat. It was technically Harold's shovel, because remember, Harold had confirmed that he loaned it to Michael, along with the gas can and everything else that he had asked for. The police also found blood mixed with the dirt where Denise was buried. They found a 9mm shell casing as well, and after some searching, they also located Denise's shirt and a pair of her husband Nathan's boxer shorts, because she usually wore Nathan's boxers when it was hot outside, including on the morning of her disappearance. During Denise's autopsy, the medical examiner determined that she died from the gunshot wound to her head, and it seemed pretty self-explanatory. But she didn't die right away. The bullet hit her just over the right eye, making it explode. Now, I know that's not actually worse than murder, but this detail just gets me. I don't know, something about her eyes bursting, it just horrifies me, and it just makes me so scared and so heartbroken for Denise. Her ocular fluid, which is that gel-like substance in your eye, that actually was that weird sticky goo that the police found on the front of Michael's car, that unidentified substance. She also had defensive wounds and other injuries that were consistent with a sexual assault. So needless to say, there was an abundance of physical evidence tying Michael to Denise's murder. But there was one key item that the officials were never able to locate, and that was the murder weapon. Still, they had enough to build out a timeline of exactly what happened and when. The police learned that around noon on the day of Denise's disappearance, Michael had visited a gun range with his friend Robert Salvador. Robert told the investigators that they were at the range for about an hour. Michael practiced with three different guns, his own 9mm, Robert's 9mm, and Robert's 22 caliber handgun. In addition to using Robert's firearm, Michael also borrowed Robert's ammunition. Robert thought that by the time that they left, they had used up all of the bullets, but he wasn't sure. Before he drove away, Robert saw Michael stash his gun under his passenger seat, which is where he usually kept it. Now, there was nothing too suspicious about any of this, but for whatever reason, after he left the gun range, Michael broke into Denise's home through an open window, took Denise to his house, assaulted her, killed her, and then finally buried her body. The police couldn't figure out why, though. Why commit these horrible crimes in the first place, and what made him choose Denise as a victim? The answer to these questions may have lied in his history. Michael was born in 1971 and grew up in Michigan. When he was young, he suffered from a very bad head injury in a sledding accident. Afterward, he also had all of these terrible headaches, even for years afterwards. 
Even worse, his family said that his personality changed a lot. He also started struggling in school, so much so that he had to repeat the first grade because he couldn't write the alphabet. Most alarming of all, Michael also became super impulsive. One time when he was 13 years old, Michael read a comic strip sequence involving a bow and arrow, and he decided to reenact it. But Michael wasn't careful, and he didn't know what he was doing, so much so that he almost fatally shot his brother. Another time when he was 17 years old, Michael saw the movie Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and he went out and he bought a chainsaw so that he could chase his family around with it. I mean, obviously this was disturbing on its own, but his relatives thought that it was especially creepy that his face was completely blank while he ran after them like he didn't even care that they were terrified of him. Eventually, honestly, I don't know how, Michael got married and had two children. But in March of 2001, his wife walked out on him. He came home and she was just gone. They divorced and they split custody of the kids. He kept one, she got the other, and they went on with their life. Afterward, Michael dated around for a little bit, but it was difficult to build anything long-term because his behavior was just, it was so erratic. He had a full-on war with a neighbor because the neighbor put up a fence after Michael's son allegedly damaged their pool. Reasonable step, a low-hassle way to keep people out. Except Michael absolutely flipped his lid about this. He keyed the neighbor's cars, he slashed their tires, he poured battery acid on their pool cage, and he also threw eggs at them. I mean, wild stuff. The neighbors filed police reports, but Michael obviously denied everything, and the police ended up doing nothing about it. The other people on Michael's block said that he made his tires squeal on purpose just so that he could be noisy, so that he could bother everybody on the street, just all this like low-grade jerk type stuff. However, none of that indicated that he was dangerous to be around. Except there were also reports that Michael looked in people's windows at night and also was a flasher himself. Then, about six months before Denise's murder, in June of 2007, he suddenly quit his job, which he had held for four years before. He didn't have anything else lined up, he didn't have any sort of steady line of income, and pretty soon he was defaulting on all of his bills, and he was in danger of losing his house. So obviously this was a stressful situation, so it might not be that surprising that Michael's behavior became even weirder around this time. He was confused all the time and just very paranoid. So it really does sound like this was the perfect collision of factors. Michael's head injury, his increasingly aggressive behavior, the stress related to his divorce, his finances. They all pushed him over the edge and led him to attack Denise. But it's still unclear why he decided to lash out on that day, of all days, or why he decided to target Denise specifically. That still is anybody's guess. There's nothing linking the two. Now, I've done a lot of research, and the best explanation that I have found is that Michael allegedly did some plumbing work with somebody who lived on Denise's block at one point. So maybe while he was on the job, he saw Denise walking outside of her house or on the porch, I don't know, and maybe he became obsessive. I don't know, this is all speculation, and even that story about Michael working on her street has not been confirmed. The other explanation, and this is the one that the police went with, is that Michael was just driving up and down the street until he saw that the family's windows were open. He didn't even know for sure who Denise was or that she was home. He just took the opportunity that was in front of him, a crime of opportunity. Regardless of why he did it, it was painfully obvious that Michael was guilty as hell. I mean, completely guilty. So he was charged with first-degree murder, sexual battery, and kidnapping. His defense attorney tried to claim that Michael wasn't mentally fit to stand trial, but the courts, they didn't buy it. And his hearing began on August 24th, 2009. Now, obviously, the trial was high stakes for Michael. He was facing the death penalty. So his lawyers pulled out all of the stops, bringing in a psychiatrist who interpreted a brain scan and said that Michael's frontal lobe was damaged, and this is the part of the brain that deals with decision-making and impulse control. He also said that Michael's IQ test results suggested that he had an intellectual disability. Basically, they were just trying to say that Michael shouldn't be punished because he couldn't think clearly enough to be held accountable for his actions. But I have to say from a legal perspective, none of that matters. There's no loophole that says it's okay to murder people so long as your IQ is below a certain threshold. The standard is that you're responsible for your own crime so long as you understand the difference between right and wrong. 
So even with his brain injuries and his test scores, Michael still knew that murder was wrong. So on August 28th, the jury deliberated for only two hours before they ruled him guilty on all counts. A week later, on September 4th, they unanimously issued the death penalty. Michael tried to appeal his sentence, but he was denied. And he still is sitting on death row today. But even though Michael is behind bars, there's still a huge issue with this case that hasn't been resolved. Namely, that the Charlotte County Emergency Dispatch seriously mishandled the kidnapping. It's all of those issues that I touched on before. Every step of the way, the authorities were completely just like flopping and fumbling this bolo and the 911 dispatcher's report. Just one or two little changes, a couple of decisions that went another way, and the police should have been able to catch Michael in time to save Denise. Her father, Rick, really struggled with how badly the entire case went. Before Denise's disappearance, he worked for the Charlotte County Police Department for over 25 years. He knew how the case should have gone. And in a press conference, he called them out for botching everything. Their incompetence cost Denise her life. Even after she almost miraculously got her hands on Michael's phone and called 911. She even pulled out her own hairs, dropped her ring, all so the investigators would have a trail to follow. But none of that did her any good. The Charlotte County Police Department has never apologized to Denise's family either. Their sheriff actually argued that they couldn't have done anything any differently, which, uh, hi, I'm not a professional, but I can think of a couple of things that could have changed up a little bit, and I'm sure all of you guys can too. And so can all of those other different 911 dispatchers who were involved in the case. The person who spoke to Denise herself ended up feeling so traumatized after everything, so much so that she quit and moved back to Iowa to be with their family. The operator who talked to Jane, the person who took so long to enter all of the information into that call log, she asked for a voluntary demotion to a desk clerk position. Even though she had 15 years of experience, she didn't want to take any more calls. Four more 911 operators also had to undergo more training, and two of them were temporarily suspended. So you're telling me there's nothing more you could have done? I don't think so. Clearly, there was evidence that they mishandled this case, and that's why there were demotions, suspensions, things like that. Then in 2008, four months after Denise's death, Florida passed the Denise Amber Lee Act, which requires new 911 operators to get at least 232 hours of training before they can officially start working. Nathan and Denise's parents eventually sued Charlotte County 911, winning $1.25 million. They used that money to create a foundation that worked to improve 911 dispatch best practices. That is where Nathan works now, traveling all across the country to tell Denise's story. So I'm pretty sure I know what you guys will say to this, but do you think that Denise's death could have been prevented? Did the Charlotte County Emergency Dispatch fumble everything? Or is this all just that kind of baseline human error that we all have to live with? Every case I cover is devastating, but I just find this one incredibly frustrating on top of all of that. Because you would like to think that some of these horrible tragedies can be prevented if people are prepared and responsive enough. And Denise's story pretty much disproves that entire theory. So let me know what you guys think. I mean, it just is incredibly frustrating. It seems like they had all of the resources, people were doing the right thing, they saw something, they said something, they called 911, minus Harold in the beginning. And still, that wasn't enough to save Denise. It's just incredibly disheartening, right? But again, it's cases like these that are just an illustration that the more awareness we can bring, it just helps that maybe in the event that we do see something and say something, maybe something will be done with that information and maybe it will save somebody's life. Hopefully, that's the hope, right? Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of 10 to Life. Don't forget on your way out to hit that subscribe button. It's totally free. And until the next one, stay safe.